Yeah, you guys are as obnoxious as uh, the people in my temple. No. I would like to uh, extend a warm welcome to everybody. I think you can now understand why we um, <coughs> limited um, our attendance to 100 people for this meeting. I think it would re require oxygen tanks if we had any more attending this meeting. This is the first, and we think uh, not the last, of our conferences on uh, personally controlled health record infrastructure. And it's a very, very um, timely meeting. I, you're here because you sense of how important this area is, but I would just like to say that the reason that you're here is because there's a confluence of events that have made not only the personal controlled health records an important part of the healthcare system of the future, but also have created entities such as the Center for Biomedical Informatics, where you currently sit, because in fact, the dean of the medical school, Joe Martin, uh, last year uh, inaugurated the Center for Biomedical Informatics precisely because we saw the following confluence. And let me try to uh, convince you of this confluence with uh, three small factoids. First, a fact, and two of the factoids relate to the following question. There was uh, two studies that were done, uh, one in the United States and one in the Netherlands, where primary care practitioners were asked what genetic tests for cancer screening had they done in the past year. So how, what percentage of them do you think said, we have ordered a genetic test for cancer screening in the past year? Any idea? 3%. That is, in fact, the modal answer when I ask that question. The actual answer is 30%. And then when people, when I say that to uh, the audiences, they say, how could this be? So then I ask the next uh, question related to that same factoid. What was the best predictor of those primary care physicians ordering that test? And this audience is uniquely uh, positioned, so you're the first audience who actually got it right in the first uh, uh, few uh, yells. Because most often people say, education, there was a family history, it's the patients asking for it. And I think that uh, tells us where we are today. Because the third factoid is, a, another study was done of the same primary care uh, practitioners about their knowledge of the meaning of the genetic test, and it was miserable. So we're here in an era where the traditional role of, phys of the physician as dispenser of wisdom and as gateway to test ordering and drug ordering is being fully disintermediated unless we move our healthcare system forward, our knowledge dissemination forward, and our knowledge management forward, uh, and data management forward in a way that actually is responsive to the needs of our patients. And so therefore, the, this theme of personal control and, and autonomy is not going to only occur in this uh, area of health records, but in the whole uh, realm of education. And I'd like to, uh, uh, before saying, extending my thanks to the organizers of this meeting, just quote uh, a very uh, influential woman, uh, Natalie Clifford um, Barney, who uh, died at age 96 in 1972, but in the Victorian era said, to be one's own master is to be the slave of self. And so I think we have to, at the same time, as we think about giving our patients full empowerment, uh, giving ourselves full empowerment, understand what that might be if we don't figure out ways to hook ourselves fully as partners into the healthcare system. With that, I'd just like to thank uh, the organizers of uh, this session, uh, this uh, two-day session, Ken Mandel and Will Crawford and Keith Stryer and Alyssa Weitzman and Patrick Taylor and uh, I'd also like to thank um, Marie and Roz um, and Andrea, who are out there uh, making things uh, work for us. And what? And Ben Rice. <laughs> ben, sorry for forgetting you. And so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, proceed to our uh, next speaker, um, Will Crawford. Will Crawford is uh, currently on leave from the bioenterprise program at MIT and is currently uh, leading, um, helping lead uh, information technology at uh, CMS, um, those who have the biggest uh, paycheck in the United States budget. Thank you, Will.
Thank, thank you, Zach. And I, I should point out that it's it's the uh, uh, biggest budget. It is not by any stretch of the imagination the biggest paycheck. Uh, <laughs> so, now I would like to, to you know, thank thank everyone for for coming here, and this is really gratifying. We've um, the whole organization team has put a lot of, of time and effort into this event, and I actually had quite possibly the nerdiest nightmare in human history last night uh, because I had a dream that David Cutler was having a, a conference next door and everyone went to his instead of coming to ours. Uh, uh, so I was actually kind of proud of that when I woke up, but uh, uh, it's great to see everyone here. Um, uh, uh, as Zach said, uh, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes. As Zach said, I uh, work at CMS in the Office of Policy, and uh, in my role at CMS, I focus primarily on health information technology issues. Um, and that's very important to CMS and, and also to our other federal government colleagues, and we have a very nice representation from a number of different agencies and a number of different aspects on personal health records and health IT in general who are here today. Uh, I think it's pretty well accepted that personal health records are going to be an extremely important part of the healthcare infrastructure in the United States. And it's also pretty well, although maybe not universally accepted, that personal health records are just that. They're personal, and that means that they're patient-controlled, and that means that they're centered on the experience of the individual patient and the data and the resources and the tools that are going to be valuable for that patient. Um, now, the idea of an Internet-based PHR, um, the idea of a technologically-enabled patient-centric healthcare system, has been around in some form for more than a decade, and we have some of the people here in this room who have been working on that for a very long time, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, but today we're in the middle of an extremely vibrant national debate that encompasses governments, it encompasses patient advocacy groups, it encompasses privacy groups, it, encom it encompasses technologists and companies and health IT vendors and vendors of other kinds of IT and vendors of boxes full of dishwashing detergent, I mean, all of whom have a really important stake in the success of a personally controlled health record infrastructure. Uh, the other thing I want to say, and this is a little bit of a, of a preview, I mean, uh, at the federal level, we've talked a lot in the last couple of years about transparency. Uh, you know, the theory going, of course, that a transparent healthcare system is going to force everyone to help develop more patient-centered approaches to delivering clinical care to patients. Uh, the patient takes control. People usually talk about two things when they talk about transparency. They talk about quality, so seeing which, which physicians, which doctors perform the best, and they talk about cost, and then which, where does the procedure cost the most. That's half of transparency. Uh, the, the third component is visibility into medical knowledge and medical information. We have people here from CDC and NIH and the NLM in particular who have been doing a lot of work and ways to create consumer vocabularies for health records. And then the final piece is transparency into a patient's own medical history. Uh, the patient has to have a view into their own background and into their own needs that is as clear and accessible to them as their view into the cost of a procedure at a hospital, maybe um, once we actually have a healthcare system that makes those costs transparent. So there are four critical components of transparency. Um, and uh, this, this meeting here is really going to focus on, on the last one. Um, on making the personal health data of the individual available and then creating the infrastructure that ties all of those pieces together. Um, personal health data, medical knowledge, cost and quality data, if you're like me in, in the federal government and interested in that sort of stuff. Um, but, uh, um, but everything ultimately that the patient is going to need to enable patient-centric health care. So that's why it's so exciting to be here. Um, uh, and uh, over the course of this meeting, we're going to talk about a lot of issues. We're going to talk about technology and standards needs. We're going to talk about business models, uh, both for companies that might provide personal health records or for agencies that might use them, uh, but also for companies that we might not think of healthcare companies. Um, uh, we have a number of people here um, from uh, companies that you would not normally associate with health IT, uh, and, uh, but nonetheless have a really substantial stake. Uh, so before I pass the baton to my co-chair, Dr. Mandel, uh, I just want to take a quick minute to recognize a couple of the people who have helped make this, make this meeting possible. Uh, in particular, uh, um, Zach Kohani, uh, the uh, director of the Center for Biomedical Innovation and the Capitol <coughs> Library here, uh, encouraged us uh, quite strongly right from the beginning to put this conference together and then has also provided his lovely library and his, his lovely pictures of dead white males. Um, so <laughs> but please, uh, you know, 
please please realize you're under scrutiny. There's a, there's a tremendous uh, there's a tremendous historical weight here. Uh, uh, as Zach already mentioned, uh, you know we've had a, a fabulous program committee who has really helped us uh, get this get this rolling. Uh, Keith Stryer, uh, uh, Ben Rice, Patrick Taylor, and Alyssa Weitzman um, have all uh, done tremendous amounts of work helping us put the uh, uh, the three working tracks together, put the panels together, um, and really try to provide a lot of information for everyone to, to chew on and to come up with a way to really hopefully make the working sessions that are going to be a big part of the meeting tomorrow really productive and useful for everyone. Um, uh, and of course I want to thank all of the organizations who have sponsored this meeting. Um, uh, Children's Hospital Boston, uh, the Center for Biomedical Informatics, uh, Deloitte Consulting, and Intel who have all uh, really pitched in to help make the resources available to make this happen, make it so that we don't have to charge for admission, that we can really keep this as a focused event, and so that's been great. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, finally, uh, Roz Vogel, Andrea Martinez, uh, Andrew Kiss, uh, Marie Boyle, um, Shane Gilbert, and Melissa Stern, who have done a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes, uh, from doing everything from putting the program books together to making sure that we had all of your bios for the program book. Uh, I think everyone has heard from, uh, for everyone here has probably heard from Andrea or Alyssa, um, and, uh, and really giving you something to walk off with. Um, um, so with that, I will hand things over to Ken. And uh, I'm going to try to do some technology here today, so we'll see how this works. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very gratifying to see this come together, uh, to feel the energy in the room. And I'm going to leave it at that. And I'm going to uh, uh, give you a little uh, amuse bouche uh, here uh, to watch and uh, remind us all uh, why we're here. The doctor will be with you in a moment. Difficult. Elaine, you shouldn't be reading that. Now tell me about this uh, rash of yours. Um, well, it's, it's, you know, I noticed that someone wrote in my chart that I was difficult in January of 92. And I have to tell you, I remember that appointment exactly. You see, this nurse had asked me to put a gown on, but it was a mole on my shoulder. And actually, I'd specifically worn a tank top so that I wouldn't have to put a gown on. You know, they're made of paper. And... Well, that was a long time ago. How about if I just uh, erase it? <laughs> now, about that rash. But it was in pen. <laughs> you fake erase. All right, Miss Minnis. This doesn't look too serious. You should be fine. What are you writing? Doctor? <laughs> Wait, wait a Elaine, you uh, really didn't have to put on the gown. Oh. It's my pleasure. I love these. You know, in, in fact, I've got one at home. It's, it's perfect when you just want to throw something on. Hi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All righty. Let me just review your history before we begin. Oh, where did you get my chart? From your last doctor. Standard procedure. You know, I can tell you my whole history. Let's just... <laughs> okay, let's take a look. Well, that doesn't look too serious. You'll be fine. Please, please, it, but it's really, really itchy. <laughs> please, I've got to see Dr. Berg right away. This rash is spreading. He can't see you, Miss Bennis. He's busy. Oh, come on. Have some compassion. Well, I hope it's contagious then. <laughs>
And with that, uh, we are going to turn it over to John Holanka. Uh, for the uh, probably two or three people in the room who don't know John, uh, he's an extraordinary individual. He's a man of many hats, and I will name a few of them, but I do not claim this to be an inclusive list. Uh, he's the CIO uh, for Harvard Medical School. He is the CIO for Care Group, which is a large healthcare system in this region. He's the CIO for Mass Share, which is our RIO, or whatever it's called um, this week. Uh, he is the uh, chair of the uh, Health Information Technology Standards Panel for the Secretary of Health and Human Services, where he has the um, a job that, I, if, if anyone else had it, I, I wouldn't believe it could be done. But, but because John has it, I think this will actually happen. He's harmonizing um, all the standards together. And John, how many standards is that? 700. 700 standards um, to initially meet the uh, use case requirements for uh, the American Health Information Community of the HHS and ONC uh, use cases around consumer empowerment, which sounds a lot like personal health records, as well as uh, biosurveillance and electronic health records. And uh, there's more information about them in the book. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. Well, thanks so very much. Well, uh, very happy to be here, of course. Many of you worked with me on Hitspe. Many of you work in the Rio. Uh, you are my friends and colleagues. So the greatest challenge was telling you something you didn't already know. So in thinking about how to put remarks together for today, I thought it would be interesting to take you inside Hitsby and just look at what was going on over the last couple of weeks, what will go on over the next couple of weeks, take you inside the boardroom at the Rio, in fact, I mean, Mickey Tripathi was there just a week ago, and tell you about some of the issues we're wrangling with, and then take you inside the IT department where we're trying to figure out what the next generation of personally controlled health records looks like and what are some of the challenges that we've encountered. So everything that I'm going to say is unscripted, it is informal, it is based on all the experiences that I've had over the last couple of weeks. So, you know, I promise to try to stay out of trouble, but, you know, if, if any of you feel that uh, I, in any way, you know, you want to keep me more honest, chime in, chime in. So we'll go through that national, that regional, and that local perspective, and I'll try to highlight as many examples as I can. So with Hitsby, uh, as you said, the challenge was as follows, that the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the American Health Information Community said, starting with three use cases, consumer empowerment, electronic health records, and biosurveillance, harmonize standards. Now harmonizing is a bit one of those weasel words. I mean, what does harmonize actually mean? Well, it's a little challenging to define, but let me contrast it with compromise. Compromise means everybody is equally unhappy. Harmonize means everybody thinks whatever you've decided is basically good enough. Much harder to achieve harmony than compromise. So what we had to do over the course of the last year, because it was one year ago that HISPE was chartered, was figure out for these very specific use cases what were those standards that would be the parsimonious set. Now, people have heard me use that word, parsimonious. You know, what does that mean? Cheap? I mean, what is parsimony? Well, parsimony can mean many things in the standards community. It could mean that we reduce everything to one standard. So that's right, you know, we're going to pick one standard and every single thing will be mapped into that one standard. And that's simplicity, but is it reality? Hmm, maybe that's not going to work. Well, parsimony could also mean, you know, we can't reduce it to one, but we could reduce it to three. No? Okay, that's interesting. And maybe it's three for now and one later. Or maybe it's three that have to permanently coexist. I'll give you some examples of this in a moment. The challenge for us when we first were given this task is we created these use cases with very specific actors, actions, and events, and we looked at the space of the standards, everything from ANSI to IEEE to ISO to ASTM, HL7, NC, PDP, et cetera, and as I said, we found 700 different standards that could possibly help with consumer empowerment, electronic health record interoperability, and biosurveillance. I did not even know there were 700 standards. But when you look at the granularity of, well, okay, hmm, we're going to have a personally controlled health record. You probably need authorization. Oh, how do you deal with federated authorization? Oh, you probably need role-based access control. That means 
Well, who can see what, when, and how? Oh, well, you probably need standards for that. And of course, those aren't the typical standards we think about when sending a prescription from here to there or a lab result. So it was quite complicated, and we had to look beyond even just the United States and look internationally, what's been done in Canada, what's been done in the NHS, what have been early lessons learned. So this, as you said, was really pretty much a daunting task. But what we achieved on September 20th was 206 different stakeholder organizations. And this is everyone from the payer, provider, employer, uh, public interest and patient advocate community, standards development organizations, all came together and achieved consensus on a set of standards and a path forward. And now let me take you inside that process and tell you what did we decide to do, how did we decide to do it, what were the controversies. So here was the challenge is that if you look at the world today, you know, it's definitely not a greenfield. You know, if you were to devise from scratch a set of standards to connect everybody with everything, maybe that would be an easier problem. But of course today we have traditionally care providers, now that can mean everything from a solo practitioner's doctor's office who's running Dr. Bob's access database on DOS, right, you know, who knows, uh, or it could be a giant hospital system that's running something Ross Perot created in 1972. I mean, right, everything from mainframe to PDA, every possible architecture you could imagine. Well, if you look at those care providers, a lot of the big guys use HL7 and its various flavors, 2.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, not a lot of 3.0 yet in this country. If you look at the small doctor's office, they've embraced CCR or have embraced uh, applications that are having, you know, I would call sort of a proprietary standard inside, haven't yet gone to something interoperable. So there's certain realities you have to recognize. If you say the world we live in has big guys and little guys, and by the way, in this harmonization activity, some people said I was siding with the big guys, and some people said I was siding with the little guys, so I felt if everybody hated me equally, I was doing a great job. <laughs> so <laughs> the reality is, ah, okay, okay. So if there are care providers, and some, like the big hospitals, are using HL7, and these uh, smaller practices are using CCR and the ASTM standards, is it reality to say, oh, well, one of those has to persist and the other can't? Well, that's pretty challenging given that they have the installed base and there's a desire of the marketplace to have, for different <coughs> contexts and different architectures, both of these standards persist. Well, similarly, pharmacies, they use the NCPDP standard. So if you were to tell all the pharmacies in this country, you know, oh, forget all that National Council on prescription drugs, you know, we're going to use HL7 for everything or X12 claims attachments for prescriptions or whatever, the pharmacies would say, well, that might technically work, but the cost to the industry of having to rip out NCPDP would be huge. So, oh, I don't think we can probably do that. Well, actually, it was also in the pharmacy space we ran into this interesting question of what is parsimony? We said, oh, well, gee, you know, drug vocabularies. We'll just use the National Drug Code, NDC code for everything. Of course, we forgot there's an organization called the FDA. And it turns out they have a, their own federal medication terminologies, and they produce the Red Book, and they wanted to keep using that. And well, it turns out when a doctor writes a prescription, I typically think of Tylenol as opposed to it's lot number 457. Oh, and by the way, it's the NDC code of the Tylenol and the purple bottle with the green stripe. So suddenly what you recognize is parsimony in the world of pharmacy is probably you need the FDA's terminology that has lot numbers, an NDC that gets down to the package, and then a doctor who will want to use something that tells you about it's a drug and it has a certain way that we deliver it. It's by mouth twice a day. Okay, well, probably have to have persistence across all three vocabularies there. Then you have the world of health plans. And health plans, of course, live on X12. They send HIPAA transactions for benefits, eligibility, referral authorization, claims, and soon claims attachments. And of course, you're also now hearing about health plans and a HIP, that's a HIP, not a HIC, uh, that talking about transportability of 
even maybe clinical records between plans. If you sign up with Blue Cross and maybe you were to have a personally controlled record with Blue Cross and then you move over to Harvard Pilgrim, how do you take that data with you? And of course they live in the world of X12, so they like that a lot. So now let's change the dynamic. Suddenly consumers are in the middle of all of these transactions. So consumer empowerment changed the, the entire paradigm. It wasn't how do I have a benefit eligibility transaction go between a provider and a payer. It's now I've got a consumer in the center and without disrupting any of those existing data flows, do I make sure the consumer has a transportable set of demographics and medications and allergies and we eliminate the clipboard. Now folks probably heard about why, because you obviously are the audience who is so well in tuned with everything that's going on in Washington, that the whole paradigm around consumer empowerment use cases was you go to a doctor's office and never again will you need to fill out the stupid clipboard. Asking your mother's maiden name for the 48th time and oh what medications are you on? So this is the new model we had to adhere to. So you've heard the constraints. HL7 and CCR need to persist. NCPDP needs to persist. Terminologies and controlled vocabularies need to persist. And X12 needs to persist. Oh my God, you know, how do you achieve parsimony with all of that? So this is what we came up with as a group. And you know, this is sort of a, again, taking you inside, you know, I, as the guy who's a non-voting chair, you know, I don't have a particular mission to achieve any one result. I don't care. I just have to achieve harmony. And so there were a number of groups that said, oh, we can achieve harmony with all that exists, starting, you know, with We'll have an interim standard and that'll achieve harmony. And you know what I found? There was no interim standard, no matter what it was, that people would be feeling good about. You know, some folks said, oh, we're going to use this, what exists today, some CDA called the XPHR Implementation Guide of IHE. And some people said, yeah, okay, that's a good start. And others said, oh, that's awful. And then others said, oh, let's just use the CCR and NCPDP. Those exist today. And people said, yeah, okay, that is pretty good, but it doesn't hit all the needs. So suddenly what I, we discovered was, and I know this, this may sound like it's slightly speculative, but none of the existing standards that exist today as configured would meet harmony for the consumer empowerment use case. So we had this bold charge. We know that HL7 and ASTM are working together on the continuity of care document. So this is taking the clinical document architecture, or CDA, and the work of the continuity of care record and putting them together into one package where you're really getting the benefits of both. The data representation from the continuity of care record with an enveloping scheme from HL7. So what we said was, Okay, group of 206 stakeholder organizations, if anything we pick that exists today isn't going to achieve harmony, will you accept that we will have a six-month window where there is no interim, and in the next six months, we're all going to work together on the continuity of care document incorporating ASTM work and HL7 work. So Rick Peters, who's here today, is uh, with Bob Dolan, going to be working very hard on that. But there's more to that, and that is that we know, uh, and of course, yes, and Keith too, uh, sorry, I, you know, I, I, just seeing all the people who I know in the audience, <laughs> didn't mean to ignore it. Uh, and we know that X12, the use of the payers demographic exchange has to be mapped into that, NCPDP on the pharmacy and medication side mapped into that. So this is, at least at a high level, what the end result will look like a continuity of care document that includes some header and metadata information, some human readable information, because we recognize that although we all would love to have semantic interoperability where every machine can understand every other machine's data, that in the short term, just being able to read your medication list is probably a good start. So some human readable data, and then codified data in an XML format that covers, as you see, medications and allergies and demographics and your provider and your insurance and some uh, disclosures you may want to make about pregnancy and advanced directives. 
So that's the work of the next six months. It really is taking 700 standards, taking that work of the workflows that I showed you of payers and providers and making sure the consumer gets into the center of that. And let's go through just, I know this is one that you probably can't read, but I just want to give you a sense of the dizzying detail that we have to look at. You know, not only do we have to look at those data transport standards that I've described, but we also have to look at every vocabulary. You know, how is it you're going to represent medications? And how do you represent insurance company information about your benefits and your eligibility? And uh, you can see here that we've incorporated such things as LOINC and RxNorm and federal medication terminologies. All of this is a roadmap for what the next six months will bring. And the great thing about this particular set of standards was that we went through all 206 organizations and did not have any objection to this final approach, this convergence of all the best of all the standards organizations work today. So still a significant amount of work ahead in the national level. i uh, give you examples. The first consumer empowerment use case did not specifically address the inclusion of things like a discharge summary or specific lab results or blood type, you know, these kinds of things. So obviously that first work we're going to do is make sure that ASTM and HL7 work closely together. We get to the basics of the demographics and the medications and the allergies. But uh, there is an AHIC meeting coming up on the 31st where I'll be presenting some recommendations to AHIC about how to now extend this beyond where we are. Because I think, you know, as a clinician, uh, I don't think you, you mentioned that, is that I, I am a practicing emergency physician. Uh, non inclusive list. Yeah, yeah. So as a clinician, I think of problem lists medications, allergies, full text notes, labs, radiology results, images, microbiology. That's what constitutes a, a health record. And although it's certainly true that in the sense of a consumer, consumer em empowerment use case, you might not include every single lab you've ever had in the last 20 years as a discrete value, at least including a document which describes some basics of this was your last renal profile, this is your current liver function, your glucose is generally around 110. You know, these kinds of things are probably pretty important. <coughs> so, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll just even give you guys the charge for those folks in the room who are HITSPE members. You saw the email that I sent out over the weekend. As you think of what are those next gaps to fill in consumer empowerment, please let me know. We uh, chatted with the folks at the Office of the National Coordinator and AHIC last week, and they felt that the best way to move us rapidly forward to fill gaps was to not come up with totally new use cases, totally new ideas, but to hang ad yeah, additional data types or additional information on some of the existing charges we've already been given. And so certainly uh, at the HITSPE panel meeting, we agreed one aspect of this we hadn't yet done is figured out how payers, again, with appropriate security and in a patient-controlled way, might be able to receive clinical data for use in a personally controlled health record if a payer was to host that on behalf of a patient because they wanted to use X12, as I've mentioned, and so how does a claims attachment as a transport mechanism work with this other work that we've done, as an example. So. That's the inside scoop. Tried to look at interim standards, tried to come up with one, found we couldn't achieve harmony, but now by taking the ASTM work on CCR, the HL7 work on CDA, NCPDP on medications, X12 on demographics and insurance information, a number of vocabularies and wrapping them together in the CCD, we get to a good first step with further work to be done on such things as documents, labs, images, and then the mapping that the payers wanted for claims attachment. Now, here's a real controversial question. So one of the things, 
everybody from Hitsby knows I'm always honest about every elephant in the room. Uh, they said, oh God, you know, there's this organization called IHE and it's owned by all these gigantic corporations and it has decided that there's going to be an architecture which will now uh, be great for large organizations, but what about smaller organizations and doctor's offices? Can I ask you to make it clear who actually owns or runs IHE? Now, now IHE, of course, is, is a group that has come together for implementation guide creation. It's a multi-stakeholder organization. So I only say all these things because when questions are asked, you say, well, okay, let's in an open forum, as you say, sort of chew on this. So did, in Hitsby's deliberation, did we come up with an architecture? Did we stipulate that you must have a certain kind of structure to use these messaging standards? And the answer is, we didn't. So let me give you, again, one of the, the fears that was had. So there is a standard that IHE has used for document exchange called XDS, and it has a piece of it that's called a document registry. Now, obviously, everybody in this room is deeply concerned about privacy. And some folks have said, having a registry that lists documents that maybe could be hacked well, that's kind of scary. Now, the question, of course, is did we, in creating this set of standards, stipulate there must be, in the basement of the White House, a document registry that has, oh, John Holamka has a, uh, you know, he has a trip to McLean Hospital and there's a psychiatric note in there. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry about that. Uh, or, gee, you know, for those who aren't from this area, the Fenway Community Health Center is a place where gay and lesbian care is delivered in an excellent fashion. So you could suddenly imagine, it, again, making this up, if there's a centralized document registry, it discloses that I have a document at the Fenway or a document at a mental health institution or substance abuse treatment center, et cetera. So people say, you know, okay, well, that's scary. Now, some may suggest that having a central registry is really good because it actually could empower an architecture. It makes it easier to exchange data. So, hey, if the patient consented and if it was appropriately secure, and you can imagine technological means where Fenway and all oh, various mental health organizations weren't identified in any way that even if it was hacked could be compromising. So you could decide to do that if you want. All we said was you build the architecture however you want we're going to just make sure that there are some messaging standards that will help you regardless of architecture. So there'll be a message that says, do you know who this person is? And do you have any stuff on them? And if you have stuff, what is it and how do I get it? And therefore, you can imagine all kinds of different architectures. It could very well be two doctor's offices communicating with each other. I mean, there is no central registry or central database of any kind. It's Dr. Office A says, hey, Dr. Office B, do you know about Zach? You got anything? Oh, yeah, here's a summary of his care. Oh, okay, great, that's fine. Or it could be a Rio, and the Rio may have a very thin center that has nothing more than a cross index of all the patients. Or it could be a Rio that has an index of the patients plus the kinds of stuff they have not the result of a lab test, just the fact that, oh, there are lab results at Beth Israel Deaconess. So that in fact, it may be for a doctor who's extraordinarily busy and goes out to a Rio and says, hey, or a patient, of course, because this is personally controlled health records. The patient goes out and says, where are my labs? I don't remember. Was that the Brigham or the BIDMC? You know, I could see that based on a registry. All of these are possible architectures. We neither dictate them nor preempt them. I mean, you build whatever you want. And similarly, one architecture could be query response. You know, what do you got? Here's what I got. Or could be a push. A result came back. I am now going to push it to you as a patient or push it to you as a doctor. And again, that could be point to point, lab to EHR, could be lab to Rio, all kinds of architectures. So just one of the things that I said at the, the Hitsby panel meeting, I just want to make sure you guys are clear about, Hitsby's role is to help figure out those interoperability standards that will make it possible for consumers to have a personally controlled 
medical record where they can get data of all kinds and transport it, but it doesn't necessitate a particular architecture. So as you can guess, uh, based on all of my comments, there was a lot of controversy. But what happened on September 20th was folks were able to, with these clarifications I've just given you, say, yeah, okay, I can live with that. And obviously we know there are going to be hundreds of use cases in the future. Uh, clinical devices, clinical trials, a lot of stuff that we'll have to work on. So uh, I have agreed, of course, to serve as chair of HITSB for as long as they want me. And it could be lifetime employment. And of course I do it for free, so that's not costing a lot. Well, now you've heard about the controversies and the solutions at the national level, let me take you to the regional level. So one of the challenges we have at a regional level is how do you have a self-sustaining business model for exchange of healthcare data across stakeholders? Now stakeholders obviously in our mind are payers, providers, patients, employers. Obviously we need to make sure that all that's highly secure and Clearly, you know, there are some interesting controversies. So imagine we have a Rio, and Ken wants to get his data from the Rio. He says, uh, yeah, I'm Ken. Yeah, trust me. You know, here's my cell phone number. Well, how do I know who he is? Well, one notion that we've had is Rios often in the past have been conceived as organizations that connect a lot of provider organizations or payer organizations. But what we're probably what you need is you need a consumer-facing sub-network organization. Now, there's another acronym for you. SNOW, oh my god, I thought I had RIO, now what's a SNOW? Well, the challenge, quick non sequitur, RIO, Regional Health Information Organization, we know that these are aggregations of folks who get together to exchange data, but they may not be regional. You know, they could be VAs everywhere or they could be children's hospitals, or they could be folks who like to do cancer care across the world, who knows? So we think that a sub-network organization simply describes a group of folks that come together in an affinity for some reason that want to exchange data. So in our region, what we've said is, sure, we have all these wonderful healthcare institutions and labs and pharmacies, but we also need another consumer-facing sub-network organization that sits as a node on the Rio and does several things. Can authenticate the patient in some way. You know, and it may be a transitive trust kind of thing that your doctor who knows who you are says, yeah, I know who this guy is and I will grant a username and password or an account to this person. Or, I don't know, have you guys thought it's going to be retinal scan, thumbprint, uh, you know, DNA testing, uh, implanted RFID? Uh, <laughs> I didn't mention it, Don. Yeah, well. No, Don really has a chip on his shoulder. It's true. It's in my shoulder, not on. Anyway. So, our regional strategy with regard to personally controlled health <laughs> records is to say, in Devo, formerly known as Ping, uh, a organization that Ken and Zach have been very much involved in serves as that consumer facing organization such that any consumer in a in completely institutionally neutral way, that is it's not partners or care group or Harvard or anybody else, can say I want to sign up and in Devo you will authenticate me and make sure that I have the right tools to participate in this regional exchange of data. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, and in fact, so this is the the great thing about being the guy who runs the Rio is I've abstracted that problem to him. Uh, so how do you solve that? <laughs> Okay. But no, so I mean, and, and so mine wasn't facetious either in the sense that just as I trust 
the Mass General Hospital to figure out which clinicians should have access to data regionally. Now let me get my black microphone there. I similarly trust Ken and Indivo to authenticate those individuals who would be allowed entry into the network and I trust that the mapping they do of the identifiers of that individual would be accurate. So the challenge, of course, we know is that many of these RIOs use things like a regional master patient index or record locator service. Well, that's great if you're John Holampka because it's a pretty unique name, but if you're Joe Smith on Elm Street and you just do a probabilistic search Ooh, that's not so great. I mean, even probabilistic searches, and we know because many of you folks in this room build those algorithms. Yeah, fine, they are in the high 90s, and you have more false negatives than false positives. You hope you have almost no false positives, but what if you're now showing Joe Smith's, and you got three physical humans in one record, and it's, oh, you not only had a brain tumor, but you had triplets this year. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a challenge. So what this group has done is they have really served as that consumer-facing organization on the Rio. Just to give you, again, I want to take you inside the Rio. Here's the challenge that we have. Every Rio in this country has, has gotten grant funding over the last two years. So that's great. You know, you build some architecture, you have a lot of ideas about business sustainability and privacy and security, et cetera. But then in 2007, when the grants run out, how do you keep the regional organization going? The way we've started to think about this in, in our region is a set of very discrete service lines or products. So, example, you know, we have a, since 1998, a financial exchange called Nihin, and that's been a way where payers and providers can exchange all their HIPAA transactions at very low cost, willing to sustain it, everyone is willing to pay in because it's taking cost out of the system. We don't use payers and we don't use, excuse me, you know, phone calls and paper and all that other stuff. Well, similarly, in our region, we've thought about e-prescribing as a means of having sustainability to our Rio because a lot of folks need to exchange medication information hey, and <laughs> payers and providers and pharmacies are all willing to pay in for that. So we have that suite of Rx gateway, we call it, services that allow our whole region to do e-prescribing quite rapidly. And in the uh, clinical data exchange, we see two kinds of business models. One where, gee, a hospital wants to push results out to somebody. Now that could be a patient, it could be a doctor, it could be a, you know, any one of, of their uh, organizations that they're dealing with and they're willing to pay for push services, but also these kinds of services that I describe where there is a record locator service. Where does the patient have data? I want to pull out data and share it in an appropriately secure fashion. And it's in that business line, in the plugging into the record locator service and the clinical data exchange, that the Indivo approach serves as the consumer entry point. So uh, we have a national health information network contract in our region to demonstrate that kind of architecture. And so that is the approach that we're using where we have Indivo as the front door to a regional master patient index and a messaging system that connects not only our local entities, but even entities as far away as Indianapolis. Uh, and uh, so Mark Overhage is here, and of course he's responsible on the Indianapolis side. And uh, the way that we've agreed to test this, now of course I, this is not a, a HIPAA disclosure in any way, but uh, Dan Nigren, who is the CIO of Children's Hospital, is a diabetic. And he is going to lapse into coma in Indianapolis. No, Mark, I hope you're listening. Uh, that uh, no, seriously, they are going to be exchanging his healthcare records regionally here as well as in Indiana using his particular issues, medications, glucose levels as a test case. So that, that is uh, you know, our approach to that. And you know, the one thing that obviously we've had to do is to figure out how to inform the regional record locator service about who Dan Nigren is and how to inform Indianapolis about who he is and try to link all these records together so that he will be able to access it through the record locator service all that stuff that's uniquely him 
and the folks at Indivo and Ken have been building that in conjunction with Computer Sciences Corporation and Mark. Now, let me get into the really challenging stuff. So this is great, you know, you've, you've seen some business lines of, oh, we've got the e-prescribing and the push services and the clinical data exchange. Now, let me just be honest. Okay, I'm the CEO, what's my charge? I've got to go out and sell this product line to customers. So I'm gonna just make this up. I go to the CFO of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Say, okay, we got this great new community-wide data exchange. Everyone will be able to exchange everything in a secure fashion. So you know all those proprietary referral relationships that we have? Gone, because now a doctor can refer just as easily to the MGH as they can to the Brigham and Women's or Beth Israel Deaconess. Oh, and you know how we used to have patients that were really tied to us because we had patient sight, which you'll see in a minute, you know, this personal health record system that's unique to Beth Israel Deaconess? Gone! They can now get just as easily to partner's data or Caritas or Leahy. Oh, and you know what? Now that we have all this wonderful exchange of data, we anticipate a reduction of health care expenditures in our state of 15%. Because today, you go to the Brigham and you get a lab test, and then you walk across Longwood Avenue and you get the same lab test because we can't share data across Longwood Avenue. So that means all the facilities charges for radiology and laboratory are going to go down 15%. So you're going to lose your patients, you're going to lose your doctors, and you're going to see a reduction of 15% in all lab and radiology facilities fees. Would you write me a check for half a million dollars to make this a reality? Wow, that's a tough sell. Now on the other... Paying somebody else's fees, you're not going to be paying the money off for the lab test that you did but didn't get paid back for. Right. Purpose to the business to exactly. attract. So, so I'm just telling you perception, right? So this is perception. So if on the other hand you spin it, and that's the purpose of this conference, is to say, <laughs> gee, you know, we are all very patient focused. Now what if the patient was the steward of their own data? And that is, this is not about connecting competitors. It's about having the patient given equal access to everything. Oh, well, that's probably something I could sell. So that's interesting that suddenly if we say, oh, we are going to, at the edge of every one of our doctor's offices and hospitals, have a standards-based mechanism for patients through Indivo or other subnetwork organizations to be able to get their own data, add to their own data, be able to be managers of their own health care, that's pretty, that's great. The only big question is, is who pays? And that's, I think, the toughest question. So I hope you guys answer that this afternoon, because to date, I have been able to go to the CFO at, say, Blue Cross, and say, what would it benefit Blue Cross if every medication written in the state of Massachusetts was formulary, ah, and every patient took their med? And we did drug-drug interactions and all the rest. Oh, you know, that would be worth millions. Would you give me 250000 to fund e-prescribing for this, uh, this wonderful statewide infrastructure? Oh, sure. But who and how, you know, do you motivate the payment for personal controlled health records? That, that's a really interesting issue. I'll tell you, I have a very funny answer for Beth Israel Deaconess. The marketing department budget funds all of our patient-controlled health record work because it is perceived as a value-added service that will help attract and retain patients. So I mean, that's one way to think about it. But uh, this is something that's fascinating about our Rio right now, again, taking you into the boardroom, is we're scratching our head and saying, well, what products and services do we offer in 2007? The grants have been great, and all the work that we've done with the Markle Foundation and uh, Connected for Health, and the NIN contract has really moved architecture and standards and technology forward, but who funds it operationally in 2007? Because it's probably not going to be the government. You know, uh, as folks probably know, you know, the NHS is putting, is it 13 billion pounds is the current number now, into their infrastructure, whereas HITSPE, the NIN contracts, all the HISPIC privacy work and CCHIT have been funded for $50 million. So 13 billion pounds, $50 million. Some challenges there. So, uh, you know, I defer that to the committees this afternoon, but I just tell you, 
I believe we can get beyond some of these political and organizational and process barriers if we make the patient the center of the interaction instead of just saying the Rio will exist to exchange everything with everyone for the public good. Because perception of reality, the CFOs are having a hard time funding public good right now. Now let me take you locally. So at Beth Israel Deaconess, over the last five years, we have had a personal health record. We have done two and a half million transactions, have about 40,000 monthly patient users. The biggest barrier to doing this, again, perception, was, oh my God, if I open myself up to the patient asking questions, oh, they're going to get their lab result. It's going to say their sodium is 141 and normal is 140. Am I going to die? Uh, and the answer has been, I can speak from five years of experience, that has never happened. We have never had a circumstance where openly sharing the problem list, the medications, the allergies, the lab results, the radiology, and microbiology has created any issue where there's been friction between the doctor and the patient, or that the patient was overwhelmed with information they couldn't comprehend, or that the doctor was overwhelmed with email. You know, obviously we had to do this intelligently. Uh, there are a couple of lab results that we delay. So that is first time HIV results, we delay a week. Uh, we delay certain pathology and cytology reports a week. The patient is never deprived of getting access to that. It was simply that we felt Getting your HIV diagnosis on the web is probably just not appropriate. Finding out you have cancer on the web is just not appropriate. So let's allow some human communication before you have that show up in the personally controlled health record. But beyond that, you know, people ask me, what's the delay for a Chem 7 or a CBC or a medication? And the answer is 50 milliseconds. You know, it hits the electronic system, and the moment that serum sodium goes to a doctor's viewer, it's viewable by the patient. I mean, there's, and people would argue, well, can sodium be bad news? You know, it probably could. I mean, hematocrit, any lab test could probably be bad news, but at least in our five years of experience, pathology, cytology, HIV, that has really been the only set that we have held for a week, and we've been okay. No doctor-patient friction. So at patientsite.org, if you want to go take a peek at the site, uh, there is a take a tour feature where you can take a look at the user interface and some of the things that we have uh, provided. But I'll tell you, you know, again, taking you into the controversies, we've been debating for a couple of years what to do about notes. Notes are tough, especially if you do retrospective display of notes. So. You know, it was 2001, and I was having a really bad day, and Zach came in to see me, and I said, you know, he's drunk again, and he probably beats his dog, and I've put that in a note, and now the patient, I mean, just to the video that you showed, is reading that I called Zach a difficult patient or whatever. Well, I think we know that transparency is good, and the patient should probably be an equal partner in all aspects of their health care, and I'll tell you that most clinicians we talk to say, oh, you know, if you start this prospectively, you know, okay, you know, I'll just make sure that what I write is appropriate. Retrospective, no, no, I don't think so. The consent model around involving doctors in this is also very interesting because with labs and meds, we've never filtered by the doc who ordered it. You know, that is to say, it's a, you know, it's a lab result. I don't go to every single doctor who possibly ordered a lab and say, Doc, do you consent to the patient to see it? In fact, what we've done is fascinating, and it's worked very well. If there is a single doctor in our institution who is willing to accept responsibility for patient questions about their labs or problems or meds or allergies, then we release them all. And that's worked fine. And you know, people would say, well, what do you do? I've got both a primary care guy and a cardiologist. And the primary care guy, he thinks paper's great and wants to disclose nothing, but the cardiologist wants me to see everything. The answer is, you see everything. And the cardiologist would then ultimately, if you had a question about, well, why am I on this med, would answer that, and it's worked great, no problems. But with notes, every clinician wants veto power over whether their note shows or not. Get your question in a minute. 
Anyway, and so just that, that's a very interesting problem. So what we're doing is a pilot where we're taking a, uh, in our primary care practice those docs who want to participate and exposing all those notes that they write. And it's on a prospective, individually consented basis. Let me just go through this and I'll take the quick questions at the end. We also have put in a personal health record where the patient can enter information. Now, I want to share this with you. This is not scientific. It's just been my observation. In two and a half million transactions with 40,000 monthly users, we've had 42 patients add data to their personal health record. Now, I'll tell you, patients love getting their lab results, but typing in their lab results from a piece of paper is just not something they're really going to do. I mean, there may be some. Or I went down to CVS Pharmacy and bought a bottle of St. John's Wort. You know, not really. But, you, you know, there are some patients who would then go into their personal health record, type in their medication, they'll look up the NDC code, do the semantic interoperability so they could do a drug-drug interaction check. Because, you know, there is the challenge that if you just type in, you know, St. John's Wort, can you do a drug-drug interaction check against free text? Oh, it's a little hard. I mean, maybe you can come up with a pattern match or something. But we've actually built the system where you can go in as a patient, type in a medication name, go look up the NDC code. You don't know that it's an NDC code. You're looking it up, and it, you pick the one that's the best match. And that way we can do a drug-drug interaction a check for you. And say very, very few folks use that. Now, there may be ways that if we just did this a little smarter that it would be okay. So, for example, we have glucose or FEV1 or weight as a data entry type you can type in. Now, if you had an electronic scale or if you had a spirometer that connected to your computer or a health buddy from Health Hero Networks that took your blood pressure, your glucose, and put it right into the per personal health record, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe they'd be willing to do that. But in terms of I got a result and I'm now typing it, they're not willing to do that. We've obviously had to wrap all of this uh, information in very good educational content. You can't just say, here's a lab result. Oh, your cholesterol is 300. Well, is that good? Is that bad? Uh, is it good for me? How does it compare to other people my age? What should we do about it? Uh, so we have worked with UpToDate, uh, and they're a provider for both pa uh, patients and providers. We put Stedman's Medical Dictionary, a drug database from Multum, and lab tests online to explain why lab tests are done. And then one kind of interesting content. Yeah, yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, Preop.com is an organization, I have no stock, by the way, in any of these, no relationship to them whatsoever, that has videos for the top 60 procedures that hospitals do that explain what is the procedure? What are the alternatives to the procedure? What are the risks of the procedure? It's not trying to sell you on getting a cath. It's just saying, oh, here's a cath, and by the way, you could have bleeding or infection or pain, but you could also have a good diagnostic of your heart, and alternatives include fast CT, which isn't invasive but isn't as accurate, you know, et cetera. And so the patient can watch these things and then can help with the doctor using a personal control record. How do I want to proceed? Just to also give you a sense of the volumes, uh, on average, I'm breaking this down, but it works out to 1.2 messages per patient per month across all types of modalities, appointment requests, referrals, prescription renewals, clinical messages. Uh, very, very common for an interaction like this. Patient goes to see a doctor. You know, I've got this sore throat, and I think it could be strep. And the doc says, okay, I'm going to swab you today and send off that culture. Here's a script for penicillin. Check your website in 48 hours, and if it comes back as strep, fill the prescription and take it. And that kind of, we're going to make this decision together. We're going to use the website as a communication mechanism. You know, you let me know how you're doing, but you'll also see your lab results. That has worked extraordinarily well. So important point, because I want to reduce fear, uncertainty, and doubt among anyone who is implementing personal health records, there has not been this overwhelming, I'm getting drowned with patient emails, how can I do this for free? Because I will tell you uh, of interest, we did a pilot with Relay Health 
again, no relationship to any company here, where we had the option for doctors to charge their patients for web visits or give them away for free. And all our doctors chose to give them away for free. You know, they just felt like doing secure email, sharing of information, doesn't really replace the visit. It's more of a supplement to the visit that you had in person seemed to be the way to go and to try to now abstract the doctor-patient relationship to purely a web interaction with your visa card was a bit challenging. So uh, that's the volume you're seeing when it's free. And Larry Summers, you know, the former president of Harvard, used to say the demand for a free service is infinite. Uh, but we're not seeing anything but what I would call replacement of the phone calls. The doctors are happy, the patients are happy. When we did a survey of 2,000 patients in the Boston area, 19% said they would switch doctors if that doctor offered a personally controlled health record. Now, just to give you a sense of what 19% means, normally if you say, we were ranked number one by US News and World Report as the best care in America, maybe you can sway market share 2%. So to say you could sway it 19%, the use of personally controlled health record is pretty remarkable. Uh, just to give you our patient population that has signed up for the personal health record, 57% female, 43 is the median age, 4% are over 70. Our personal health record happens to work on web TV, so you can use your, your keyboard and web TV if you want. You know, 70% uh, of our uh, patients have access to the internet. There is a digital divide. Zach has actually done some studies on this, but we've actually also seen because you can use it in a library kiosk or you can use it in the workplace that we've not had so much the I don't have access to the internet therefore I can't use this. It's worked pretty well across all demographics. So as I say, it's worked really quite well for secure messaging, for labs and meds and access to all this data, for patient education. A barrier to adoption, and taking you on the inside, the skeletons in the closet here, is that we have built a personal health record that sits outside the doctor's usual workflow. And this is just, you know, 2001 when we created it, personal health records weren't considered at that time really quite mainstream, so we built it as a web application the doctor has, oh, I'm doing my records here. Oh, I go over to this website and I do all this interaction with the patients. So our rate limiting step in rolling this out further has been of our 600 primary care docs, about half say I'm willing to go out to a different website to do this personally controlled record thing and share data with the patients. The other half say I'm gonna wait until you make it part of my normal workflow. So that is, I log in in the morning, says, doctor, you have to sign three charts, you have four emails from patients, and you have two lab tests to review. And when that happens, then I will go into this sort of patient site workflow that I hear from my colleagues works pretty well. So in 2007, we are rewriting our standalone patient portal and simply actually now reducing it to patients you get a personally controlled health record as part of the website for Beth Israel Deaconess and doctors, there is no separate application. It's integrated into your EMR. It's part of your workflow to receive messages, sign off labs, renew medications, etc. We've even built recently uh, with SureScripts and RX Hub an automated prescription renewal system so that the patient can initiate a medication renewal, a pharmacist can initiate a medication renewal, or a nurse can initiate a medication renewal and it shows up in that work list in the EMR for the doc to sign off. And that's just an example of how we're trying to do that type of integration. Well, I know I'm almost out of time, so let me just summarize that I think at a national level, I hope that the standards we're all working on together will empower payers, providers, patients, standards development organizations, and vendors to achieve this level of interoperability that this whole conference is all about. I hope that at the regional level that we ensure there's a sustainable business model that puts the patients in the center of this provider-provider communication, which is, again, perception or reality, politically contentious across organizations. And that I hope our local projects that have shown Doctors are not overwhelmed. The patients love it. We have not communicated bad news inappropriately. 
and we don't have to charge the patient to empower them with a personal health record and secure doctor email, at least to date. I hope that reduces some fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So I know there are probably several questions, so let me open it up. Absolutely not. First of all, thank you very much. Absolutely not. <laughs> Precisely because that was such a wonderful talk, and John, it really was a very, very nicely done talk, um, and in the, with the exactly right scope. I could see that um, if we actually allow the questions to flow right now, our schedule would go to hell. Oh. And so. Okay, uh, look outside and take one or two. So what, what I'd like to do is, John, are you coming to the reception tonight? I will. I would like to invite those of you who have questions to uh, not let John get near his food uh, tonight and uh, ask some <laughs> questions there. So I would like again to thank John for a wonderful talk. Six thirty. Keep your questions and, till and, then. And, and actually, we do have a to celebrate your your new relationship.